So today's lecture is going to be on the treatment of violent offenders. So what is a violent crime? A violent crime in the U.S. is defined as any crime where one person intentionally inflicts physical injury upon the body of another person. So while there can be acts that are violent that happen by accident, this is not considered a violent crime. The key here is the intentionality. So these crimes in the U.S. comprise assault and battery, robbery, which is theft combined with the use of some sort of force, homicide, which is comprised of murder and manslaughter. So manslaughter is when you have a fight and somebody accidentally dies. You, your intention is not necessarily to kill them, but you are fighting with them and then they die. Murder obviously is, is has some premeditation or some thought put into it. Kidnapping, sexual assault crimes, and armed robbery. And so within each of these crimes, there are various degrees of severity. So you can have simple battery, aggravated battery, sexual battery, and other types of variations. So in terms of our definition of violence, again, it's here, we I want to emphasize the intentionality and the malevolence. So you were doing this with malice, physical injuring of another human being without adequate social justification. So this is not self-defense. So while you may, with some intentionality, hurt somebody else in terms of defending yourself, the, um, there's a social justification for that. Here, um, for violent behavior, there's no adequate social justification for hurting somebody else. We don't include self-injurious behaviors, which we see very commonly um, among offending populations. So that's when they hurt themselves, they'll cut themselves up or things like that, because there are other reasons why they engage in those behaviors. Um, so that's not considered um, violent, offending, violent behavior. But it doesn't have to be anger motivated or goal oriented. And we'll discuss a little bit about <clears throat> the difference between those. We do associate violence frequently with anger, and in many instances, anger is associated with it. But there are other reasons for why people engage in violence, which we'll talk about. And there doesn't have to be a particular goal. It can just be that somebody is beating the hell crap out of somebody as a, um, you know, because they feel like it or there's just impulse control issues. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, anger is not a prerequisite um, for violence, although we do see it as a common antecedent, meaning it often happens before the violent act occurs. But we do see uh, aggression without the presence of anger as well. So the good news here is that um, violent crimes have decreased significantly over the past two decades. Um, there's been a recent uptick again in violence. You can see that we were we were down to about um, 1.2 million acts um, in 2015, and then in the recent couple of years, it's gone a little bit back up again. But overall, the trend is, is downwards, and so that is, is very encouraging. So when you look at violent crimes in 2016, the majority of those are aggravated assault. So that's somebody hitting somebody else um, with some purpose. Only 1.4% of violent crimes are murder, thankfully. 7.7% um, are uh, rape. And about a quarter, a little more than a quarter, are robbery, which is theft with a violence involved. We also do see, um, when we look at the different types of crimes, that firearms or weapons are used in them. So in about two-thirds of homicide cases, a gun is used. Um, others can include knives and other t or, or simply just beating somebody to death. In assaults, about one-fifth of the cases, or 21%, involve some sort of weapon. And in robbery, 41% uh, involve gun use. In many cases, that's important because in many states, there are additional sentences when weapons are involved. So people can get up to 25 years more sentence because a gun is involved in the crime. So according um, to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, about half of all those convicted of violent crimes were under the influence of drugs and alcohol when they committed the crime. So you can see there's a strong correlation between the use of substances and engaging in violent crimes. So when we're thinking about treatment programs, that's something that we need to keep in mind because those two things seem to, to co-vary. So when we're talking about the treatment of violent offenders, we're not talking about somebody who gets into one fight once. We're talking generally about those who are persistently violent. And how do we define somebody who's persistently violent? So that's somebody with a history of serious violent offenses, either as a juvenile or as an adult, or can continue from um, adolescence into adulthood. So this is multiple, like three or more 
um, convictions for violent crimes. They also have a record of institutional violence, so that within the correctional facility they are engaging in violence. So either physical threats or actually assaults against staff or other offenders. And you can see that in their disciplinary records, many of them spending long periods of time in the hole or solitary confinement. You also see with these persistently violent offenders that they are using weapons frequently during the commission of their crimes, so guns, knives, etc. And we also see a lot of evidence of explosive behavior that's not um, as a result of a psychotic disorder or any other kind of overt mental disorder. So these are kind of falling into um, intermittent, explosive, intermittent explosive disorder or impulse control problems. So um, when we look at things that are associated with violence and impulse control disorders, we look at kind of those persistently violent offenders are in our third category there. So we see antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy, borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, um, psychotic disorders, depression, alcohol use, substance use, um, neurocognitive disorders, um, medication effects, and intermittent explosive disorders. So that doesn't mean that everybody who's a persistently violent offender um, has a, a disorder, but it's very likely that if you are persistently violent, you will likely meet at least criteria for antisocial personality disorder, which is basically repeated acts of delinquency that have started um, and have continued with disregard for other people. You'll see that other types of psychological disorders can re um, result in violent behavior, such as intoxication, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, but it's not the persistently violent offenders that we see in the criminal justice system. So when we think of violence, we think a lot about anger. The two are correlated, and that's what we kind of find in about 50% of the cases. Um, people looking at retrospective reviews of offenders behave violent fit. Uh, behavior found that in more than half the cases, anger pre uh, preceded the actual violence. However, to me, that then suggests that in 48% of the cases, it didn't. So what's going on with those? Um, we just see that there is a lot of aggressive belief. So it's kind of the hostile view of the world. Um, that those who are persistently violent have. So it's you've probably seen individuals like this, but these are people like you're in a crowded bar, somebody bumps into them, and they're immediately thinking, you did that to me on purpose. They have this, you know, they, they seem to be people who want to get into a fight with other people. They have a, a persistently negative outlook of the world, that the world is a hostile place, and that they have to defend themselves against that hostility. Um, but we know that while anger is um, an antecedent to violence, not all violence um, is started by anger or increased anger or arousal. So we see that some offenders use violence instrumentally. And you'll see this, like if you think about the Sopranos or gang violence, where you have to have a rate of initiation, where sometimes you don't even know the victim, um, but you have to do a job. Like you, you know, you have to extricate money from somebody. You have to rough, rough somebody up or engage in some kind of gang ritual. And you're not even, you know, angry at that person, but that's why you engage in that violent behavior. So there's some sort of um, outcome that you're trying to gain using that violent behavior. So we do see that those who are persistently violent have cognitive distortions regarding interpersonal conflict, meaning that the way that they think about situations is wrong. We talked about cognitive distortions when we talked about cognitive behavioral therapy. So basically, that's the way they view the world. They're seeing, um, they're viewing the world incorrectly. So instead of, you know, that person bumping into you in a crowded bar and thinking, wow, it's really crowded, you know, that person fell into me by accident, they're thinking that person wanted to get me, they pushed into me on purpose, and that results in kind of aggressive and hostile acts. And so this makes them believe that other people are acting with malice, which leads them to um, aggression and feeling that they have the right to use violence to defend themselves because the, the other person was acting um, negatively towards them, that they were acting with malice. We also see that impulsivity is related to um, violent behavior and that a lot of people who engage in these persistently violent acts have poor self-regulation of their behavior, meaning they're not thinking before they're acting. Um, then they have little control over their behavior when they get aroused. So something happens, they're feeling angry, and they act on that, whereas other people might look at the consequences. People who are persistently violent often don't have the skills or the capacity to do that. That could be you know, a neurological impairment 
or it could be something that was just never learned. So impulsivity is defined as the inability to be reflective or the interval, interval between a particular event and the individual's response. So, you know, like if you think about Sesame Street, I was watching with my son the other day, um, they were talking about stop and think. Um, so people who are impulsive cannot do that. They don't look at the pros and cons. They don't weigh the behavior economics of the situation. What are the positives and negatives of engaging in, in aggression and this, they just act without thinking. And so we do know that aggression has been linked to impulsivity. So in terms of motor aggression, acting without thinking, um, cognitive decision making, making quick decisions and not thinking or caring about the consequences. We do know that there is um, some link between mental illness and aggression. If you look at the Venn diagram, the people on the right are people who are violent, the people on the left are people with mental illness, and then there is some overlap between people with mental illness and people who are violent, but um, that is not a significant number of people. It's less than 5% of those with mental illness will necessarily act violently. Alcohol is much more of a risk factor than mental illness. So we often think, and you hear now with all these gun crimes, and, um, and that you know it's mental illness that's causing these things. And while mental illness can contribute, there are many other factors. So we also see, you know, young age, being male, having a history of delinquent behaviors, and substance abuse being more um, common risk factors for violence than any kind of mental illness. We do see that though that people who have antisocial personality disorder, which is a pervasive pattern of disregard for self or others and who are engaging in you know, repetitive violent behaviors um, combined with substance abuse are at high risk for violent behavior. So um, here is a lifetime prevalence of those uh, for violence with those people with and without mental illness. So if you have, um, no major substance abuse issue or mental illness, their lifetime prevalence for violence is 7.3%. Um, so if you have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, your rate for uh, violence is 16.1%, so a little roughly doubled. Um, if you have substance use or dependence disorder, meaning drugs or alcohol, your chance of engaging in violence is 35%. So you can see that that's um, a bigger risk factor. And if you have a major mental illness and substance abuse, that then increases your risk even further. So it's really the substances that are adding to this proclivity for violent behavior as opposed to the mental illness itself. So let's talk a little bit about the treatment of violent offenders. And you can see here, um, these guys have special desks. So these are high risk individuals and they're actually chained to their desks while they're in their treatment program so they cannot attack. Um, in Canada, they would have these pens where there was a person in the middle and then there was kind of cages around and that's how they would engage in treatment. They would be kind of together, but there would be physical separation. So this is for the safety of the instructors for these persistently violent individuals who could be aggressive during the treatment. Um, when frontline therapy for aggression has been pharmacotherapy. So we do see kind of short-term use of pharmacological agents uh, when somebody is acting in a, in a threatening manner towards themselves or others. So you'll see um, in prisons or forensic psychiatric hospitals, um, medications will be used to calm people down. And these are when people are just out of control and there's no controlling them, but these have to have rapid onsets of action and since this is, you know, people are in crisis, they're not likely to cooperate with oral medications, so they're likely going to get an intramuscular injection, um, a likely of some sort of antipsychotic and anti-anxiety med medication or a sedative in order to calm them down if there's been kind of a rapid escalation of violent behavior. I did have a client once who had um, intermittent explosive disorder and he, because he was not reliable, he was already out in the community and he was not reliable in taking his medications, um, he would get injections of antipsychotics once a month. But you would see increases in his arousal levels towards the end of the month as um, the medications wore off. It was actually scary, like intermittent explosive disorder is kind of like you just go from zero to a hundred like all of a sudden. And he came to me one day. Um, you know, after being arrested and he had scratches all up his face and he had no recollection of, of what had happened, but um, he'd been got, gotten into a fight with his, um, his girlfriend, the police were called, and then he just lost it. 
And what his, what he was told, because he doesn't remember any of it, was that they put him in the back of the police car and he just started scratching his face and thrashing around to the point where he had concussions and scratches all down his face. So it's kind of scary and there was some neurobiological issue going on with him. So he needed to have medication in order to control those. This is an algorithm that people use in terms of um, whether medication should be prescribed. You'll see more and more in medicine people are using these algorithms. So does the subject show aggressive behavior? Yes, no, no, you don't do anything. Yes, you proceed. Is it impulsive? If yes, is it secondary to another mental and medical condition? If yes, then you have to identify the condition. Does the treatment improve the aggressive behavior? Yes, no, and so you can go in and it'll tell you what type of medication might be helpful in those situations. So there are different types of algorithms that are available, but if you are working in a, in a setting where medications are prescribed, an algorithm like this might be followed. Um, we don't know that uh, psychopharmacology is actually, or medication is helpful in the management of violence with individuals with um, personality disorders like antisocial or psychopathy. Um, it's more in those who have that kind of high level of arousal or impulsivity control that we, we can use medications. And you know, researchers have concluded based on many reviews that medications are not a solution for violent behavior. They can help you know, in that instant, but they're not gonna cure the individual and so what may happen is for those people who have these high arousal levels is that medication permits them to engage in kind of cognitive behavioral interventions where they can learn skills to help them reduce their risk for engaging in violence um, with the goal then of weaning them off those medications. So we also have specific treatment programs that are designed for those who engage in violent behavior, but to date there's not been a lot of, there haven't been a lot of published studies. Paula Cech, who works out of um, New Zealand, she is one of the researchers that's doing a lot of work in this area. We also see Oliver and Wong out of Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, and so while we do know kind of what works, the, the treatment programs largely um, have not been well methodologically controlled, but we have seen things that address arousal levels. So that's kind of um, your level of, you know, agitation kind of alternative thinking or irrational thoughts. So that's targeting those aggressive cognitive distortions. Um, Novako, um, who does a lot of the anger research, developed what's called stress inoculation, where you kind of get into people's face, you get them agitated, and then you teach them, you kind of expose them to those feelings and teach them skills um, on how to decrease those arousal levels. Although that could be dangerous with persistently violent offenders as they may act out on those. So it's not really recommended to be doing those types of interventions in a prison setting. And we often see anger management programs that are kind of prescribed to people with, with violent crimes. Although the, the research is really still out since we, as we talked about, only about half of the crimes that involve violence are caused by anger, which means that you know half of them have nothing to do with anger. So giving somebody who doesn't have an anger management problem because they're engaging in violence, an anger management program, um, may not be effective. And so we still don't know exactly for many individuals what caused their aggressive behaviors. And so a lot of that is important in assessment to figure out what was causing those behaviors and how we're going to improve upon that. So what we do know is that cognitive behavioral pro therapy programs that adhere to our R and R model have demonstrated the most success, and we've seen decreases in violent recidivism as well as general recidivism. Um, these programs generally engage offenders in group or individual sessions and have to last for at least 150 hours. And that's because these are high-risk offenders. Um, all these pe all these crimes are high risk for recidivism. People who have violent acts tend to recidivate at much higher rates than some other types of offenders. So one specific program that's um, received a lot of um, study is the Violence Prevention Program in New Zealand that's run by Dr. Polacek. She actually came to John Jay on a, on a sabbatical um, a couple of years ago, so I had the pleasure of, of meeting with her. It's a hierarchical, it's a hybrid program, sorry, meaning there are two components. The first is a closed group cognitive behavioral intervention, which is structured, meaning that there's certain modules that you go to. The closed part means that, you know, that you start with one set of guys and those are the same guys that you have. And so you build a relationship with those people. An open group is that people can kind of come and go um, as they please. 
but that kind of interferes with the group cohesion. The other part of this program is a therapeutic community, um, hierarchical meaning that people come in at different levels and so you kind of work your way up and get more responsibility um, or you're voted to have more responsibility as you're demonstrating better behavior. It's based on group CBT principles. Um, so you're seeing it's, it's targeting um, offense supportive thinking, so cognitive distortions, mood management, so not just anger, but also other emotions that might be related. So for some people, they may be behave aggressively when they're depressed or anxious. Um, talks about problem solving strategies, so that's that stop and think, looking at pros and cons, different ways of solving problems. And then we focus on relapse prevention. So that's a little bit of the stress inoculation part of it, but really planning you know, high risk situations when they're released and how they're going to handle those more effectively. So in this program, um, they're delivered in pairs to 10 men at one time, and they attend group sessions for 250 hours over 25 weeks, and they're in therapy for about 10 to 12 months. So you can see that this is really intensive, but when you think about it, violent crimes are really severe. And if you think about our risk needs responsivity model, those who are at highest risk for reoffending, meaning these really persistently violent offenders, need the most intervention, so that kind of makes sense. Um, the treatment in this program is manualized, but therapists have some flexibility using the manual, meaning that they, there are some, you know, there are targets for each session. However, it's not scripted, meaning that they can kind of um, use their own style in delivering the program. And uh, the therapists take part in individual team and group supervision, so they get together um, and they, because this is such intensive treatment, um, they get a lot of supervision, both individually, but also in group where they can talk about different cases and work through that. So this is some outcome data. Um, so this was one of the better controlled studies where they had a treatment and comparison group. There was not random assignment, but they were matched in terms of age approximately and severity of the offenses. Um, and so you can see that those who were treated breached parole about half less than those who did not receive um, the treatment. They were reconvicted uh, significantly less um, than those who, the comparison group, um, they, um, their reconviction for violence was about half that over a 12-month period of the comparison group, and their re-imprisonment also was about half that. And all of these are statistically significant, and if you look at that five, that's that fourth column, um, the 0.21s and the 0.15, so those are moderate effect sizes, which shows that, that this this treatment was quite quite effective um, in decreasing violent behavior. And these are with high-risk guys, so that's pretty um, exciting. So here we have some outcome measures. And so one of the things that you guys are going to be doing with your own treatment programs is learning to evaluate things. So when we have um, violent prevention programs, we want to evaluate whether people are changing. So there's self-report measures like anger inventories, hostility interviews, which are kind of targeting aggression, um, and cognitive distortions, um, and then also criminal thinking style. So, you know, you, those are some measures that you could give to the offenders, both before and after treatment, to see if those kinds of things are changing. We also then have clinician-administered measures, where you have psychologists or mental health professionals who look at the offender's records and also interview them, and then score measures, such as the psychopathy checklist revised, the violence risk appraisal guide, and the violence risk scale, where they look at both static and dynamic factors for, um, for these, these constructs. Other measures that people use to assess outcome in violence prevention programs are decreased institutional violence, so that's both verbal and physical, rate of transfers to reduce security, so moving from a max to a moderate or minimum security facility, granting release, and withholding of detention. So those are all other measures as well as recidivism, obviously, in terms of measuring outcome. One thing, that, um, one group of individuals that we see a lot of violence with is gang members, and um, violence is highly correlated to gang membership. A lot of the work that we're doing in the field now is on prevention, so stopping people from getting involved um, in gangs in the first place. But once they are gang involved, the treatment becomes a lot more complicated because, um, you know, there are gang affiliations with within the prison system. Um, many people who are not even in gangs will join um, once they, be, they, they, they enter into prison. And some are blood in and blood out, meaning that you know if you leave the gang, there's a great probability that they'll go after you and kill you. So there's not much incentive to dissuade people from being members. 
However, the membership is related to violent behavior. So um, what they're trying to do a lot of the times is gain the trust of key gang members, um, like so the leaders of the gangs and prisons, and that then encourages others from the gang to, to get involved with treatment. You have to be careful when forming groups because you want to make sure that you're not necessarily putting rival gang members in the same treatment group, otherwise that could lead to a lot of problems. Um, but we do know that similarly to what we just discussed, these high intensity CBT programs actually cut in half the recidivism of those who are gang involved. And the last thing we're going to talk about today is psychopathy, which is highly correlated um, with, uh, with violent behavior. You've probably seen, you know, on Dexter and a lot of the movies um, about psychopathy. Here they have Hannibal Lecter. Um, and these are people who, um, it's considered a personality disorder, although it's technically not in the DSM-5. Um, you know, what we see is antisocial personality disorder, which is the factor two part of psychopathy. But the factor one part is this kind of callous disregards for the rights of others and a lack of empathy or a sense of responsibility for other people. It's just that they don't care. They only, there's this egocentrism and this, um, you know, failure to really think about how their behavior affects other people. That then in combination with factor two, which are the predatory and violent behaviors, that's more the antisocial characteristics, um, leads them to engage in violent behavior. We have a lot of people, which you'll hear are called successful psychopaths, um, who have factor one traits, but don't have factor two traits. And so they don't engage in the violent behavior. So they don't end up incarcerated necessarily, but they do cause lots of chaos and destruction in the business world because of, of these, you know, this lack of remorse and the callous disregard for the rights of others. Um, psychopathy was coined by Cleckley in 1941 in his work, The Mask of Sanity. And there's been a lot of clinical lore that psycho those with psychopathy cannot be treated. Um, that isn't necessarily the case, and that came from one study that was done in um, kind of the 60s and 70s where they gave people psycho, uh, psychogenic drugs, so they were kind of hallucinating, um, and they found that those people with psychopathic tendencies um, tended to get worse in these kind of these using these types of medications, but the study was so poorly designed. But because this is a tough population to treat, I think that clinical lore kind of um, perseverated and we still hear today that psychopaths can't be treated. Um, we do know that they don't do so well in unstructured programs um, and that they can manipulate others around them and cause a little bit of havoc. Um, and we also know that they have much higher attrition rates, meaning they drop out of programs um, at higher rates than those who don't have higher levels of psychopathy. But there really are very few methodologically sound studies looking at the treatment effectiveness of those with psychopathic personalities. Um, one of the biggest problems is even the definition of psychopathy. You'll see if you look at the research um, that it's measured using the psychopathy checklist and people generally the cutoff is 30, but you'll see that many people in these studies have much lower, many like significantly lower levels of psychopathy, so 20, 25. So they don't technically meet the criteria, quote unquote, for psychopath psychopathic personality disorder. Um, recent efforts to address these concerns in terms of the methodology, methodology has found that treatments actually can be effective with those with psychopathic disorders. This is a 2013 study by Oliver and Wong. Um, and you can see that um, those who completed treatment um, who had psychopathy, uh, which is the third bar, um, had uh, significantly lower rates of both sexual and violent recidivism as compared to those who dropped out. While they're still higher, the last two bars are those with psycho psychopathic personality disorder. The first two bars are, are those without. Um, you see that you see those with psychopathy still recidivate at higher rates because they are high risk. Um, the, completing treatment really does decrease their both sexual and violent recidivism. So we do know from laboratory evidence that there is something quote unquote wrong with those with psychopathy that their brains function differently. So it's considered a neurocognitive impairment. Um, they don't learn like you know if you remember Seligman and his dogs and like when they were shocked they. They learn to avoid different things. People with psychopathy um, are not influenced by negative consequences or negative responses. So 
It suggests that psychopaths are more reward focused or incentive oriented. So they'll persist in pursuing a goal, even though they receive um, cues to, you know, they can get lots of negative feedback or punishments, but they'll still continue to pursue those goals. So it's really um, probably unrealistic to think that our treatment programs are going to quote unquote, get rid of psychopathy, that we are fundamentally going to change those people or that we're going to give them empathy or that we're going to teach them to pause and reflect. Rather, we might want to change the way we view this. And so if we're viewing this as a deficit in those skills, what we want to do is to, to not have them offend. And so while it's difficult if they have these type one characteristics, um, we really are the, it's the type two characteristics where they're hurting other people and engaging in criminal behavior that we want to stop. And that's what our treatment programs are showing that they can actually do. What I found very interesting is these are the effects of psychopathy with the age. And you'll see the dark um, dots are the factor one. So that's that lack of remorse and empathy and those callous um, feelings. And you'll see that's pretty steady across time that that doesn't really change, but it's those type a factor two traits, that violence, that aggression, that hostility, that decreases over time. So we'll see that um, psychopaths kind of burn out in terms of their engaging in violent behavior over time, even without treatment. Um, it's, it's a function of age, um, which falls within the, the desistance literature that we kind of talked about with people just kind of stopping engaging criminal behavior with age. But I think that's kind of interesting because there's these two components. So we're not able to change kind of fundamentally who these people are, but we can change the behaviors and that those will decrease naturally with time. But we see that with treatment, those also decrease. So that's the end of the lecture today. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions and I will see you soon.